Let, let's turn to Philippians <laughs> chapter 2, and we're going to read together um, the, the first 11 verses. Philippians chapter 2, and we're reading the first 11 verses. Philippians chapter 2, I'll read the first 11 verses, let's hear the word of the Lord. <coughs> if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man at his own things, but every man also in the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every knee, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. We know that the Lord will stamp with his own approval and blessing this reading of the Holy Scriptures. Now my text this morning it's taken from Philippians chapter 2 and the verse 5. It reads, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now my theme today is entitled, Cultivating the Mind of Christ. So you know the text, Philippians 2, 5, and here's the theme, Cultivating the Mind of Christ. Now let's try and remember the overall context of these words. The Apostle Paul is in prison. He's writing to the church at Philippi, a church under God which he helped found. And of course, at the very formation of the church, remember there was a wonderful demonstration of the power of God in the gospel. Precious souls were gloriously saved. Acts 17 records how the Lord opened Lydia's heart. It also records how a demon-possessed girl was delivered from demon possession and how a rough, godless uh, jailer uh, was gloriously changed and transformed. And not only was he himself saved, but his family was uh, saved. Of course, from these humble beginnings, God was pleased to add to the church. And over time, the church was established and the church flourished. And by the time the Apostle Paul was writing to the church under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, this was a thriving, vibrant, New Testament, strong, true, gospel, Bible-believing church. Yet Philippi was not without its problems. You see, in Philippians chapter 2, 1, Paul deals, I believe, with the threatening problem of division and disunity in the church. And from his prison cell, he's calling for a united front because he's become aware that the church at Philippi suffered from a spirit of disunity. That disunity had set in. In particular, two women were at loggerhead, so Paul exhorts the whole church to remember and to consider their constellation in Christ. They, they were to remember the fact that they were in a saving, organic relationship to Christ. They were in him. They were to remember their comfort in Christ. That is his love to them. 
They were to remember their communion in Christ and their compassion in Christ. And we learned that from verse 1. The apostle then also called for true harmony in the house of God. Paul is very conscious of the sin of pride and selfishness, even in the church at Philippi. He's conscious of the saints being too high-minded, of thinking too highly of themselves. And this, of course, has led to that spirit of disharmony and disunity, a very serious thing. A danger, of course, that hinders the uh, testimony of Jesus Christ. Remember the Bible teaches a house divided against itself cannot stand. And also remember that disunity and disharmony dishonors the Lord. It brings the Lord's name into disrepute. It's a serious sin. And it needs to be repented of. It needs to be avoided at all costs. It has the potential to destroy the church. And of course it gives a a tragic advantage to the enemies of Christ to to talk and point the finger at, at, at what is happening in the life and context of the church. The Apostle Paul in verses 2 through to 4 has called for true harmony. He's called for them to be like minded. Verse 2. He told them of the need to be loving, having the same love one for another. He instructed them to be low-minded. Listen to what he says in verse 4. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Now, Paul's approach in making this call is not to complain, not to criticise, Not to condemn. No, in order to deal with this problem of disunity and to help them to foster a right spirit, he points them to Christ. Christ, of course, is the greatest example and pattern of true harmony to the church. And there's a lesson we should learn. In all that we face as a church collectively, In all that you face as a Christian personally, get your eyes on Christ. Off your circumstances onto Christ. Off the situation onto Christ. Christ and the cross. Be fixated with him. Now, notice what he says. Verses 5 right down to verse 11. These, I believe, are some of the most important (coughs) verses in the whole of the Bible. This is really what we could call theologically a true Christology. Yet it can never be divorced from the context. The context is this. A true unity which promotes a true humility and harmony is centered on Christ. You see, this is not just a new section. Paul's not dealing merely with a new line of thought. Yes, it's full of the doctrine of Christ. We admit that. Yes, We're treading on holy ground. And there's many weighty great truths here. But it's setting forth the ultimate example and pattern of true humility. Which is found in the person and work of Christ. And we should never lose sight of the big picture. Paul is pleading for unity. Asking the church to set aside the difference. Calling for them to be of one mind. To take the lowly position. To think more of others. To put others first. Not to be self-serving or self-seeking. Pursue and promote harmony and humility. How? By cultivating the mind of Christ. Now that's very easy to read, isn't it? And very easy to recite. But it's not so easy to do. Naturally... We're proud. And we all expect to be treated better than we sometimes are. And we refuse to be treated as a doormat. And we react badly if we feel we're being treated in a certain fashion that that is demeaning to us. And of course, that, that stems from the sin of pride. Pride clings to us. We have to admit that. Probably the truth is we, 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 we cling as well to a certain amount and element of pride. We, we, we don't really think of others or put others first or esteem others before ourselves. At times we can be full of our own self-importance. 
Is not one of the signs and marks of the last days, men shall be lovers of their own selves, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And Paul's advice to this church is, don't be possessed with the mindset of the world. Have the mind of the word. Don't have the mind of the godless. Strive to cultivate the mind of the godman. The wonderful thing is about the Apostle Paul to encourage God's people, to instruct, exhort God's people. He always pointed them to Christ. Christ is the great pattern. Christ is the great example. Of course, remember this, that Christian living must never be divorced from Christ. That applies to every aspect of our Christian life and testimony. It's a, it was a common practice among the uh, always the apostles to, to point the believers, the saints of God, to Christ. In order to be happy, in order to promote harmony and unity in the house of God, cultivate the mind of Christ. And of course, we have to be clear, there's no other example in history which compares remotely to the humility of our Lord Jesus Christ. His humility is unique. It's without <coughs> parallel. And it's crucial that we grasp that. There's a battle going on for our hearts and minds. And if we think wrongly, we will behave wrongly. The mind has a controlling influence. This is what he says. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, just three simple thoughts this morning. I want you to think firstly of the portrait of the mind of Christ. He says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. So let's think about Christ's mind for a moment. The word mind here means attitude. It has to do with our thoughts. It's possessing a, a Christ-like attitude. And as we deal with others, we have the attitude of Christ. Now, of course, the truth is we, we can't really delve into the mind of Christ. It's a, it's a notion vast of knowledge and wisdom and to me, it would be absolutely impossible to uh, fully try to grasp all that's in the mind of Christ. We, we can't fully know the mind of the Lord. In fact, it's not what the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 11 and in the verse uh, 34. He, he said this, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counsellor? But Christ, I believe was heavenly minded. <coughs> he had a sound mind. You've maybe heard the phrase, so and so, so heavenly minded, that they're of no earthly use. Well, I don't believe that to be true. I don't think that's possible. Because I believe the more heavenly minded we are, the more we're of a sound mind, the more earthly use we're going to be. And you've got the example of Christ. Because Christ was of a sound mind. Let me tell you this this morning. Christ knew who he was. When he says, let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. He mentions Christ Jesus again. Look at verse 6. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now, now who is Jesus Christ? Or who is Christ Jesus? Here's the answer. The chief answer. He was God manifest in the flesh and that brings in the whole doctrine of the incarnation christ is god absolutely in, in, inherently eternally unchangeably gloriously here's what he is he's god in the flesh and that's a big subject he's co-equal co-eternal coexists with the father and not only he, he knew who he was but he knew what he came to do Hebrews 10, 12 says, But this man, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down in the right hand of God. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And if you're a lost sinner, Jesus is seeking for you this morning. He gave his life, the Bible says, a ransom for many. And if you think of the verse 6, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. The, the word robbery means not an exaggeration for him to claim to be God. Why? Because he was forever conscious who he was. He was forever conscious of what he had come to do. In other words, 
He, he was filled with that. He, he, he was of a, a sound mind. Now, before conversion, no believer could claim to have a sound mind regarding God or regarding Jesus Christ or regarding sin or regarding heaven and hell because our minds were darkened. Our minds were really rotten to the core. We, we didn't have the mind of Christ. But when conversion took place, not only was our soul saved and our heart was changed, but our mind was renewed. We were given a new mind. We, we had new thoughts about God, new thoughts about Christ, new thoughts about heaven and hell, new thoughts about our soul. I often think of Mark 5 about the uh, wonderful change in a man called Legion. Uh, and uh, when the Lord Jesus uh, dealt with him and gloriously saved him, we, we find him clothed uh, and sitting in his right mind. Mark 5 tells us his right mind. In other words, it, it, was, a, it was a new mind. Doesn't the Bible say that God has not given us a spirit of fear, uh, but a spirit of love and power and of a sound mind? Second Timothy 1 and 7. A mind to think right. A mind to remember who we are. And remember who you are this morning. If you're saved, you're in Christ. We were singing. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. That we should be called the sons of God. Remember who you are. If, if you're a, a, a child of God. If you're a Christian. You're, you're, you're a, a son of God. And let's remember what you're about. You're not only one of God's children. But you're one of God's servants. And because there's been a change in us and because our, our mind has been renewed, we begin to think differently. I'm in Christ. I'm a servant of the Lord. And therefore I must seek after the ways of God. And I must seek the word of God. And I must seek the will of God for my life. And I must seek God in worship. You know, once we begin to grasp the mind of Christ, I'm, I'm convinced that that's one of the greatest incentives for missionary work. Who am I? I'm a son of God. What am I? I'm the Lord's servant. Uh, and, and therefore, because I'm, I've got a right mind now, I, I can go and engage in the work of God. Uh, I want you to think also quickly, Christ had a single mind. Uh, as we have this portrait of what his mind was like, it was a single mind. He, his mind was consumed with one objective, to please his heavenly Father. And to do his work. And to do his will. And all that he said and all that he did. He never acted independently of his father. In fact he said I do always those things that please the father. Christ was never in two minds. No sometimes we're in two minds. Should I or shouldn't I? Should I go here or sh should I go to a different place? But remember what we read of Christ. Lo I come in the volume of the book it is written of me. I delight. What? To do thy will, O oh my God. Psalm 40, verse 8. Christ was never carnally minded. For to be carnally minded as death, he, he was of a, a, a single mind because his mind was spiritual. Remember I told you the word mind means affection. Think of Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. Set your affections on things above. And the margin in the author writes says, mind. So often our minds can be in other things, the things of time and sense, the, the things of the world, our own pleasures, our, our pursuits, our, our own possession. But Christ was different. He had a single mind. His mind was consumed with pleasing his heavenly father. And remember his father said at his baptism, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He said it again at the Mount of Transfiguration, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. And I, I just want to say this morning, this mind is produced by the Spirit of God. That the singleness of mind. Now that I'm a child of God as a Christian, and I'm the Lord's servant, I, I want to live to please my God, to please my Heavenly Father. You, you can't be a Christian and live like the devil. You can't have Christ and engage in a life of sin. You, you can't be a Christian and live for the things of the world. That's not the teaching of the Bible. Some people imagine that the teaching of the Bible is you can profess to be saved and live like the devil and, and be assured of heaven and home at the end of the life. But that's not the teaching of the Holy Scriptures. Paul says for me to live as what? Christ. And Christ is the very sum and substance of the gospel. 
Peter urged the readers to whom he was writing to gird up the loins of their mind. It was to be a, a single mind. It was to be shut into this truth for me to live as Christ, to die as again. It was also to have a spiritual mind. I don't believe the Lord Jesus ever thought evil of any man. I don't believe the Lord Jesus ever had bitter thoughts toward any man. I believe his every motive and every conversation was only pure. He had a loving attitude towards his father. He says, speaking of his father, I delight to do thy will. He never chided his father. He never complained. He didn't criticize his father. He was the darling of his father's bosom. He was his father's delight. He was the apple of his eye. He had a love to God. We live in an age where there's loads of disrespect. And we, we see this maybe in some sense to children, to parents. Where's the old boy at? Where's the old lady? And that's been disrespectful. Christ was never disrespectful. The Bible teaches us that shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. Christ had a love to his father. He had a love to his friends. I think of Lazarus. Prime example. He loved his foes. So think of the rich young ruler who, who left Christ. And the Bible tells us that Christ was sad at that saying because he loved him. And, 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 and his mind was spiritual. Love covers a multitude of sins. So that gives us a little insight this morning. And I'm only like opening up the can a little bit to, to, to try and help you to understand. When the Bible talks about the mind of Christ, this is what it means. Being of sound mind. Remembering who you are and why you're in the earth. To, to have a, a single mind. But a mind that's spiritual. A mind that's got a loving caring, compassionate attitude in all your dealings, in all your speech with other people. I want you to think uh, very quickly, secondly, the pursuit of Christ's mind, for he says, let this mind be in you. When he mentioned the mind of Christ, he was encouraging these people to, to strive, to cultivate such a mind, to have the same attitude, to have the same affection, for the, the things in the work of God. How? Let, let me suggest three things. To be selfless. This is an age of self-promotion. An age of self-preeminence. The tendency for some is to be puffed up with pride. To have a high view of themselves. To think little of others. And maybe even to adopt the attitude, you know I'm better than he is or she is. I'm glad I'm not like them. But Christ was never like that. Christ never thought nor acted this way. Everything that he did, he did with a selfless love. He did nothing out of strife. He did nothing out of vain glory. Notice, if you think of verse 6, who being in the form of God thought not robbery to be equal with God. Verse 7, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of a cross. Now, these are profound words. And we will come back to them. And we will open them up a little bit more. But, but overriding these three verses, he was selfless. Christ was marked with a deep humility. Why had he come to earth? The Bible tells us there in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 8 and the verse 9, an amazing statement. This is what it says. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. You see, it all points to a life of self-denial. Christ was selfless. 
And, and using this illustration, Paul is saying, or, 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 or he's saying to the church at Philippi, don't be selfish. Be selfless. And he gave the greatest example of selflessness. Because remember, this was all voluntary to Christ. He was never forced to do anything against his will. He said, I have power to lay down my life. I have power to take it again. You even think of these words here in verse 8. He humbled himself. And you, you think of the, the steps of his humiliation down from the bosom of the Father to, to, to the bosom of the Virgin Mary. And, and why did he do it? All to do a saving work. To save souls. For the benefit of others. He gave his life a, a ransom for many. The one adored by the Father. The one who was worshipped by the angels. And he humbled himself, the Bible says, and became obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross. The, the, the one who was the delight of the Father to, to end up on a cross, to do a saving work, not for those who deserved it, but for those who had no strength to save themselves, for those who were sinners in his sight, for those who were enemies, for those who were ungodly. Isn't that the very opposite of the spirit of the age of the 21st century? What is the spirit of this age? It's me first. It's a spirit of selfishness, self-promotion. There's a plague of me-ism. And of course it's easy for the believers to fall into the very same sin, the sin of self-first and self-promotion. And what's the answer to that? It's to be selfless. A life of self-denial. Denying yourself. D denying the, 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 the rule and control of the, the, the inward reigning corruption in your life to, to deny the, the, the pull and lure of the world. This is an important principle. Christ lived and died for others with a voluntary selflessness. Utter sacrifice. Haven't we lost that spirit of sacrifice? We need to recapture it. How can it be recaptured? Here's the answer. Cultivate the mind of Christ. Christ was also submissive. If you look at the words in verse 8 again. And became obedient unto death. Think about Christ's obedience for a moment. In the book of Hebrews we read there in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8. A, a, a tremendous statement. It says this. Though he were a son. And remember, he was eternally the Son, always was and is the Son of God. Yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Now, he only and always was obedient. He was never disobedient. But he, he learned obedience. He, he was submissive to the Father's will. And the work that the Father gave him to do. And he did it without resentment. He wholly submitted himself. Remember what he says, Psalm 40 verse 8. I repeated it now for the third time. I delight to do thy will, O oh my God. He, he, he said on another occasion, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. He said on another occasion, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. He was the perfect servant. And he lived by the Father's word. Remember he says in Matthew 4 and verse 4, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. No matter what the world says. Don't be disobedient <coughs> to the word of God. To the work of God. To, to the will of God. Haven't we lost our ability to, to tremble at God's word? Aren't we all guilty at times of being disobedient to what the Bible says? I'm not just thinking of the Sunday services and remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, the midweek service, the call to prayer. But, but in the nitty gritty of husbands loving their wives and wives uh, loving their husbands and the relationship with parents and children, the, the, the workplace, in the day to day living out our lives in society, it's, it's being submissive. 
to, to what God says in his word. He was obedient unto death. I, I want you to think also he, he was steadfast. Because it says, even the death of the cross. That word even ha, ha, has struck me. Not only was he obedient unto death, but it was even the death of the cross. And what a horrible death crucifixion is. And no matter what the Lord Jesus faced, he never withdrew from his God-given purpose. He was unmovable. He, he, he was steadfast. He remained true. Doesn't it, doesn't it apply to the Christian? Doesn't it apply to the, the, the church? We, we can't go back. Why? Because we're the Lord's. Because God has called us. God has chosen us. God has a plan and purpose for us. And we need to be committed to that. Oh, isn't that something that we need today? Commitment. Commitment to Christ. Commitment to his church. Commitment to his cause. David asked the question, is there not a cause? And of course there is. And it used to be in the early days, the Free Presbyterian Church, where we were wholly committed to that cause, to a man, to a woman, to a young person. And they were thrilled to be identified with Christ and his church. We've lost a bit of that. Why? It's tied into the mind of Christ. If we have the mind of Christ, then we'll, we, we will be wholly committed. We'll remain steadfast to whatever unfolds as life throws at us. And I want you to think lastly, not only of the portrait of the mind of Christ, not only of these few principles that I've given you, but I want you to think of the power. You see, if we have the mind of Christ in the context here, it will promote harmony in the church. The psalmist said, in Psalm 133, in fact, one, one of the shortest psalms in the Bible, but uh, a, a psalm that has a tremendous punch and truth to it whenever we uh, think of the words. He says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Uh, and, uh, and it says here, um, For there the Lord commandeth the blessing, even life forevermore. Y you see, to dwell together in unity. It's when the church is united. That God commands the blessing. And in order to promote that harmony. We need the mind of Christ. In order to have this hope of the gospel. In order to be, be happy in Christ. In order to promote holiness. It all ties in to the mind of Christ. That's the power of Christ's mind. Once we're gripped by that, of my need to be steadfast, my need to be submissive, my need to be selfless, then that will help to promote this harmony and unity in the church. And, and, and isn't that something that we need in our day and generation? We need the blessing of God. And the blessing of God is absent. For a variety of reasons. And I'm asking this morning as one of the reasons because we're not as united as we think we are. And of course if division and discord and disharmony comes into the church like it was doing in Philippi. Then the only answer to that there is for the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you. Strive to cultivate the mind of Christ. Strive to have a sound mind. A single mind. A spiritual mind. And endeavour by the grace of God in your pursuit of that to be selfless, submissive and steadfast that we might know this power in the church. May the Lord bless you this morning. Thank you for coming. We trust and pray the Lord will meet with us as we come now around the Lord's table.